Good afternoon, everybody. It is December 9th, 2020. I hope that you've had a blessed 24 hours since we've last studied the Word of God, and I look forward to diving into John chapter 5. There's a lot we can learn from. There's a lot we can take away from this. And I want to open up with making sure that we understand why the Gospel of John is written. If you remember, I have shared in the past Bible lessons that we've done in John thus far. The purpose why the Gospel of John was written. According to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 31, <clears throat> the Gospel of John was written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and that by believing you may have life in his name. <clears throat> so, maybe you're someone who is new to our Bible study, and if you are, thank you for tuning in. I want you to know that if you're an unbeliever, I pray that you will see what's laid out in the Gospel of John become convinced of who Jesus is, let the Holy Spirit work in your heart, and that you will become a believer, and that by becoming a believer, you will have life in Jesus' name. This is his promise, and we will see another promise that Jesus gives today concerning those who believe in John chapter 5. And I want to say that I am at home. I want to remind everyone, so if you hear children in the background, those are my kids, and um, I may pause here and there, depending on how loud they are, if they get close to me, because I want today's recording to be beneficial to you. Um, so, without further ado, let us jump in John chapter 5. And I also want to mention, before we do that, that I noticed in previous Bible studies, uh, the past two Bible lessons we've had, John chapter 3 and John chapter 4, my breathing was being picked up on the microphone. So I'm currently adjusting my microphone right now. So I'm hoping that you will not be able to hear my breathing um, in the microphone. So I hope that this is beneficial to you. And I hope that this is not distracting at all. So if you do hear feedback, please let me know. So I'll know whether or not to switch microphones. So here we go. And what we're going to do, we're going to jump... Uh, we're going to read John chapter 5, verse 1 to 16, and then we're going to go back to that, talk about it, and then kind of move move along John chapter 5. So here we go. John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethsaida in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. Now this day was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. Verse 11, he replied, The man who made me well told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Verse 12, who is this man who told you pick up your mat and walk, they asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was, because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Do not sin any more, so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. That is chapter 5, verse 1 to 16. So we begin chapter 5 with this pool. By, a sh by the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethsaida uh, in Aramaic. So it was believed from my research that this pool filled with water, the disabled, such as the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed, would go down into this pool, and the pool would come, would be stirred up by an angel, is from what I've gathered from my research, and people would go down into that water hoping to be healed from their diseases. Um, 
This man, there's a disabled man. We see a disabled man who's been disabled for 38 years. That's a long time to be disabled. And Jesus sees him lying there, and it says he, Jesus realized that he had been there a long time. And Jesus asked this man, he said, do you want to get well? The man responds with saying, well, yes, I do. But every time I try to go down into this pool, someone cuts in front of me and goes down ahead of me. So I'm trying to get in this pool of water, but I can't get down in there. Uh, I'm disabled. I can't get down in there. People keep cutting in front of me. I can't do it. So Jesus, instead of having him continue to focus on the water, going down into the water to get well, Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. Immediately, this man gets up and he walks. He picks his mat up and walks. This may be easy to say right now. Um, Casually, I can say this. We're just reading what the scriptures say on paper. But actually witnessing this, I want you to put yourself in the day, on this day in history, as if you were there, present with Jesus. Knowing that this man had been disabled for 38 years, and all of a sudden, someone comes by and says, pick up your mat and walk. And that's exactly what happens. This is a miracle. Remember Jesus' first miracle, turning the water into wine. His second miracle, healing the boy that belonged to the servant, the official, in John chapter, I believe it was 4. And now, we're in John chapter 5, where he heals this disabled man who's been disabled for 38 years. Imagine the joy that ran through this man. Imagine... I I can't imagine the joy that ran through this man. I've never been disabled. But I'll tell you what Jesus has healed me from may not be a physical illness. He has healed me from my love for sin. I don't love to sin. I, I, I hate sin. I don't like it. I don't want any part of it. The fact of the matter is I'm not a perfect person. I still sin every once in a while. Not because I like to, but because I'm I'm not perfect. Um... And in no way am I endorsing sin. Um, The grace of God teaches us not to sin, but let's not fool ourselves and lie to ourselves and say that sin is not a reality and sin is not a struggle with Christians. Uh, The Bible actually says the complete opposite. But Jesus has healed me from my previous addictions. Uh, Maybe you have a smoking problem. Maybe you smoke cigarettes constantly. Uh, I used to as well, all the time. Well, I'll tell you, when I came to Jesus, um, my my addiction was broken. I'm speaking for myself. Um, I gave that to Jesus, and it was broken. I haven't smoked a cigarette for eight years. Uh, same thing with marijuana. haven't smoked marijuana for eight years. And this is just my testimony. Um, but Jesus, I ask you, what has Jesus done for you in your life? Think of something. You've been blessed in many ways. The fact that you're breathing today is a blessing. The fact that you have food is a blessing. Has he healed you of any physical disease? Has he healed you from any previous addiction? That's for you to examine, and that's for you to uh, testify about. But concerning John chapter 5, verses 1 to 16, we see a man who was healed by Jesus, who had been disabled for 38 years, instantly. Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. And as we continue to read, we come before a group of people, a group of Jews, who said to this man something ridiculous. They ask this man, who told you to pick up your mat and walk? This is the Sabbath. You are not permitted to. To carry your mat and walk. Let me tell you something. The Mosaic law did not permit the the, the Mosaic law did not prohibit anyone from picking up their mat and walking. The Mosaic law on the Sabbath day was a day of rest for the Jewish people. It was a day of rest. That's what it was. However, 
you had groups of people, such as the Pharisees, making additional laws and requirements, wanting to bind them on the necks of people, wanting to add additional laws to people. This is this was the case. the The Sabbath did not pr- prohibit this man from getting his mat, picking it up, and walking. And the sad thing is, a miracle occurred. So, these people who said this, it says the Jews who said this within the context, I don't believe it gives a specific name, I don't believe it says the Pharisees specifically, it just says, the Jews said to the man in verse 10, this is the Sabbath, the law prohibits you from picking up your mat. I want you to focus on where the heart of these people, where their hearts were. Rather than rejoicing with this man that he had become, he was healed of all, of being disabled for 38 years, rather than being happy about that, rather than rejoicing about that, they were caught up in legalism, they were caught up in law that had pretty much no no care for the fact that this man had just been healed all they cared about was there was this man keeping their additional laws their rules and regulations that they had come up with they did not care about the fact that this man was healed they cared about this man obeying their rules and regulations i must take the time to mention that this is still a reality today. The group of Pharisees may be long gone. They may not go by that title, but I'll tell you, the reality is people still like this exist. There are many people within the church, many false uh, believers probably, I would say, who seek to bind additional rules and regulations Additional commandments, additional prohibitions that you never find in the Bible. They seek to bind these onto other Christians. And if you do not obey their rules and regulations that they believe exist uh, and they that they hold to, you will be excommunicated, you will be labeled an apostate, and you will be labeled a false believer or a uh, false teacher if you're teaching. Um, against this, which I will probably be, I would probably be labeled a false teacher, but that's okay. There are people that still exist like this today. (laughs) Rather than embracing the liberty that is in Christ, um, people seek to bind people under law. And in this case, they were still under the Mosaic law. However, these people had come up with an additional law that this man was not allowed to pick up his mat and walk. And he was just healed from being disabled for 38 years. We need to understand that. This was a miracle. This is something to rejoice about. However, these people chose to take this opportunity to find out who told him he could pick up his mat and walk. Rather than rejoicing, they cared about, they only cared about who this, who told him he could pick up his mat and walk. And they wanted to know who it was. And this man, he he didn't know at first. But then, Jesus finds him in the temple later. And Jesus confronts him and he says, See, I've made you well. You are, you are no longer disabled. Do not sin anymore so that something worse does not happen to you. So, what does this mean? Well, according to my understanding of the scripture... The reason why this man was disabled was because of his sin. Now, should we paint with such a broad brush of saying the reason why people are disabled today, um, blind, lame, and all that, is because of their sin? I am not quick to do that. I feel like taking a scripture such as this, such as John chapter 5, verse 14, and saying that, okay, this is the reason why people are disabled, blind, and um, deaf, I believe that's a stretch, and I believe that you shouldn't paint with such a broad brush. But this does show that in this man's case, the reason why he was disabled was because of his sin. And that may as well be the case today. 
sin has bad consequences. Sin may have physical consequences. Sin may affect your physical health. That is just reality. Sin, nothing good comes from sin. And in this case, for this man, he was disabled for 38 years. And then we continue to read, The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. you got to remember who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who came up with the Mosaic Law. He is the Word, and he was... Remember John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus was with the Father. And eternity passed, according to the Scriptures. He was way before Abraham. He was during the time that Moses came up with was given the mosaic law this was not the purpose of the sabbath you could pick up your mat and walk on the sabbath there was no law that prohibited that uh, therefore it says verse 16 the jews began persecuting jesus because he was doing these things on the sabbath you know today you may do many things that other churches disapprove of, such as playing cards, such as wearing pants, uh, certain lengths, such as having your ears pierced, such as uh, maybe maybe you have a tattoo, maybe you got a tattoo, etc., etc. Uh, all these additional laws. For instance, for my heritage, maybe you use instruments in your singing to God in your church gatherings. Um, and many, some churches, uh, specifically Churches of Christ, prohibit this use of musical instruments for the glory of God and they had their own reasons and I know why they had their own reasons I used to believe what they believe and I don't anymore because it is false teaching um, but they have a law against the use of musical instruments in your church gatherings uh, being used for the glory of God doesn't matter the reason they say it's wrong uh, because according to them you don't have scriptural authority for it and that's a talk in and of itself I'm not trying to get into that however uh Today, many Christians are persecuted for doing these things that others disapprove of, doing these things that others have made laws against, even though those laws cannot be found within the Scriptures. Uh, and the unfortunate part is people don't understand that uh, Christians are not under law, you're under grace. Uh, so, And keeping Christ's commandments have their own place. Of course they do. Uh, but it's Christ's Jesus says commandments, not anyone else's commandments. It's not anyone else's additional commandments that they bring to the Scripture. If they're convicted about something that the Scriptures don't outright talk about or address, then they should follow their conscience. But never, in any circumstance, should they ever try to make someone submit to their rules and regulations that they come up with. Uh, and uh, So, we'll continue. Verse 17 to verse 23. Jesus responded to them, my father is still working, and I am working also. This is why the Jews began tr began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, the son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son likewise does these things. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. And just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son also gives life to whom he wants. The Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all people may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor their Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So I'm going to break this down verse by verse. Verse 17, my father is still working, and I am working also. <clears throat> the father gave Jesus a specific mission to complete, and it was to keep the Mosaic Law, to die for our sins. And he, he had work that he had to do. He had prophecies that he needed to, be, need to fulfill. Um, he needed to fulfill the prophecy that, which says, the lame speak, the tongue, uh, the tongue, what is it? The deaf hear, the blind see, and... Uh, those who could not talk, talk. Uh, 
He came to fulfill these scriptures. He came to fulfill these prophecies given in the Old Testament. He had a lot to accomplish. So, he came to do his father's work. Verse 18, it says, This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. First of all, Jesus was not breaking the Sabbath. He never broke the Sabbath. The Sabbath. He established the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for Sabbath. The Sabbath was for the Israelites' benefit. Uh, they were not to become enslaved as a servant of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was for their benefit, for their benefit. Um, I think many people today, unfortunately, make additional commandments or commandments in and of themselves as... Um, something that we are supposed to be slaves to, in a sense. Yes, we keep the commandments of God, such as loving our neighbor, but uh, we don't do that to become a slave to that commandment. Rather, the commandment's for our good. When we love our neighbor, we are less likely to have conflict with people. That is for our good. Verse And continuing in verse 18, Jesus made himself equal with God. This was something that... Uh, was considered blasphemy, uh, I mean, for anyone to do. You say you're equal with God, well, you're saying you're perfect. You're saying you're 100% perfect. Um, that's exactly what Jesus was saying. I am equal with God. Jesus called God his Father, and Jesus was making himself equal with God. It's pretty, cr- it's crystal clear. John chapter 1, remember, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And remember John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. He came to the world. He came to His own, but the world did not. They did not know Him. Uh, his own rejected Him. Jesus was with the Father before the beginning of the world, the foundation of the world, according to the Scriptures. He made Himself equal with God, And this is why the Jews are trying to persecute him. Verse 19, Truly I tell you, the Son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son likewise does these things. So, we see Jesus healing people. This is God the Father, Jehovah, the Father, healing these people. Jesus is doing exactly what the Father would be doing. So, this man who was healed for 38 years, this was an act of the father. Um, the boy that was healed, but the official son, this was an act of a father. Lazarus being raised from the dead, this was an act of the father. Everything Jesus done, he did it as a representative of the father, and he only did what the father would do. This is how him and the father are one. Verse 20, For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. (laughs) Jesus had done many great things. Jesus had performed many great miracles. And these miracles testified about who he was. There's There's a place in Scripture that specifically says, Jesus says, If you don't believe my words, believe the miracles in and of themselves, because they testify about who I am. Verse 21, And just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son also gives life to whom He wants. So, just as the Father raises the dead, Jesus also can do the same. This is why Jesus promises eternal life to those who believe in Him, to those who place their trust in Him, their faith in Him. You receive eternal life, not because you have the capability of raising yourself from the dead, No, because the Father has given Jesus the authority to raise whom he wants from the dead. And if you are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, you will be raised from the dead. Guaranteed. Because that's what Jesus says. And we'll see that as we continue to read. Um, But Jesus has been given the authority by his Father to raise whom he wants from the dead. Verse 22, The Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that, verse 23, all people may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So it's really important that we understand that when you honor 
Jesus, you're honoring the Father. Uh, when you deny Jesus, you're denying the Father. If you deny Jesus, you are denying Jehovah, period. Uh, because Jesus was sent from Jehovah to declare his truth, to declare the grace of God that is given all to the world um, for us to receive by faith in Jesus Christ. And once you deny this gospel, you are denying God. You are denying your only source of getting right with God, and that comes through the gospel. Um, in verse 24, Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who, has, who, who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. I'm going to read that again, and I'm going to make this crystal clear. Truly I tell you, anyone, meaning anyone, who hears my word, so you hear the word of God, you hear the gospel, and believes him who sent me, believe in Jehovah who sent him, has eternal life. This is a present tense. This is the result of what happens when you believe the gospel. When you believe the gospel, you immediately receive eternal life. This is not something you work for. This is not a long time process. This is not a lifetime process. You do not work for this. Once you believe the gospel, you receive eternal life at that moment. That's not all that happens, though. It says, after you, be after you hear this message, after you believe him who sent Jesus, and after you receive eternal life, you will not come under judgment, but you have passed from death to life. So, once you believe the gospel message, after you hear it, you receive eternal life. And because of that, because of receiving eternal life, you're justified, you're made right, you're declared righteous before God, you pass from death to life. You do not come under judgment. The judgment that unbelievers will go through, you as a believer, you as a Christian, will not come under that judgment. Not because Gary Johnson said that, because Jesus said that. Some people think that getting right with God, preaching a message like this, saying something like this, uh, promotes sin. Boy, oh boy, by no means. Some people call this uh, easy believism. Well, uh, or cheap grace. Nah, no, not at all. That It's not cheap at all. It cost Jesus his entire life. It cost him to live a perfect life, to give his body on the cross. It was not cheap at all. It cost us nothing because the gospel is declared as, as free within the scripture. The gospel is free. And once we believe the gospel, we, re we receive eternal life and we pass from death to life. Um, and we do not come under judgment. That is the result of believing the gospel. That is what Jesus said. Uh, and because of this, we ought to live for the Lord. We live for the Lord out of gratitude for him. We love the Lord. We keep his commandments. And we grow in the process of sanctification. That is what we must do. And verse 25, Truly I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So, truly I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will now live. So, there will come a day, it's pretty clear, I'm just kind of going over what the scripture says, there will come a day of uh, the resurrection, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Um, Tony Evans has a uh, section on his commentary of this I'd like to share with you. Uh, and let me, uh, let me finish reading to verse 29. Jesus says, For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he has granted to the Son to have life in himself. And he has granted him the right to pass judgment because he is the Son of Man. <laughs> Do not be amazed at this, because a time is coming when all who hear, when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good things, to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. So, Tony Evans has a commentary on this. He says, whether people experience eternal life or condemnation as or after the resurrection, 
will depend entirely on their response to Jesus in this life. If they believe in Jesus, they will have done good things because of the eternal life in them. If they did not believe in Jesus, they will have done wicked things because of the lack of life in them. In verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So the Father gave Jesus a specific purpose to come here and to fulfill his will, to do his will. And, and Jesus, he says, he only judges as he hears, because his judgment is just, because he and his Father are one. Verse 31 to verse 35. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies about me, and I know that the testimony he gives about me is true. You sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. I don't receive human testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. John was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. I'll continue to read verse 36. But I have a greater testimony than John because of the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. So, uh, to end at verse 36. Jesus, if you want to know who he is, say you live back in the days of Jesus, his word was not the only thing that he had to testi testify about him. Sorry, microphone, if you heard a big bump, I just hit the mic. Jesus' words were not the only thing that were there to testify about him. His works, his miracles testified about who he was. John, he was a burning and shining lamp for a little while. And those, these people were willing to rejoice um, during his time. But Jesus wants them to understand John must decrease and he must increase and that Jesus' testimony is greater than John's. Why? Because of the works that the Father has given him to accomplish. John did a great thing. John came and prepared the way for the Son of God. He did something that was great. However, his ministry is much, 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 much less. Can't even be compared to Jesus' ministry. Uh, verse 37, the father who sent me has himself testified about me. So Jesus has the father's testimony concerning him. Jesus says, you have not heard his voice at any time and you haven't seen his form. Verse 38, you don't have his word residing in you because you do not believe the one who he sent. So if you want to have God's word residing in you, you must believe in Jesus and whom he sent. It's pretty simple. Now, verse 39, I really want you to pay attention to. Verse 39 to 40, specifically. You search the scriptures because you think that you have eternal life in them, and yet they they testify me about me. You are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. There are many today who search the scriptures thinking that in the scriptures they can find eternal life. It's one thing, as it's been said before, it's one thing to know the word of God, the written word of God, but it's another thing to know the living word of God. Tony Evans has said this, and I really appreciate his quote on this. It's one thing to know the written word of God, but it's another thing to know the living word of God. Do you know the living word of God, or do you just know the written word of God? Many people search the scriptures thinking that in them they have eternal life. Thinking that knowing the scriptures give them eternal life. Or thinking that um, keeping commandments that are shown within the scripture, that are given to us within the scriptures, gives them eternal life. <laughs> Jesus says that's not the purpose of that. That's not the purpose of the scriptures. The purpose of the scriptures are for them to point you to me. So that in me you can have eternal life. We have a lot of Bible worshipers that exist today. Don't get me wrong. The Word of God has its place. The written Word of God has its place. However, the Bible in and of itself is a collection of 66 books. You are not to worship that those 
collection of 66 books within your leather binding. Those point you to the one who you are to worship, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is outside of that Bible, meaning he lives in in heaven with God. He is at God's right hand. The written word tells us about Jesus. The Gospel of John was written for the purpose of telling us about who Jesus was and that we can know who Jesus is and that by believing that Jesus is the Christ and the Messiah, we will have life in his name. That is why that is written. So it's important. Eternal life is found in Jesus, not within the scriptures. The scriptures point us to the true source of eternal life, but knowing the written word does not, you know, there's no, I don't want to make this, confusing for you long story short the written word points you to the living word as tony evans perfectly says eternal life is found in jesus and the scriptures point you to that source of eternal life which is jesus himself in verse 41 to 47 i do not accept glory from people but i know you that you have no love for god within you i have come in my father's name and yet you don't accept me if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe, since you accept glory from one another, but don't seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will curse you to the Father. Your accuse you to the Father, sorry. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But if you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe my words? So, the fact of the matter is, Moses wrote about Jesus. The Old Testament points you to Jesus. These Jews did not believe in who Jesus was. They, you know, they were just seeking to persecute him. They did not believe Jesus' words. Jesus was telling them about himself. They didn't believe what he was saying about himself. And Jesus specifically says, in verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. So, I must ask believers today who are under law, who, who want to be under law, maybe it's a Mosaic law, maybe you want to keep some commandments under the Mosaic law thinking you're going to get right with God, or maybe you want to keep your own set of rules and regulations thinking that keeping those uh, will get you right with God, or the lack thereof of keeping those will get you um, out of your relationship with God. <laughs> Are you like those in this, these Jews within this, this section of scripture that are, are you like those? Blah, blah. Are you like these people who are setting their hope on the Mosaic law? Are you setting your hope on something else other than Jesus? Many people do that today. Many people think that it's okay. Many people say, yeah, little Jesus, a little of this, a little Jesus, a little of me, that's perfectly fine. No, it's not. It's not fine, and in fact, it's a false gospel, according to the scriptures. It's, it's all of Jesus. It's by Jesus alone that you have eternal life, and he alone should be where your hope is at. Your hope should never be in your good works, and your good behavior, anything like that, because if you place your hope in, that, in those things and how you live and how you act, Oh boy, your hope is going to be gone <laughs> a lot. Uh, but in Jesus, your hope remains, should remain the same because he is forever here for us and his work is complete, 100% perfe perfect, and was done for our benefit. So, um, the ending of chapter 5, but if you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe my words? <laughs> A lot of people don't believe Jesus' words, especially when it comes to receiving eternal life. Some people believe that receiving eternal life is hard. Some people believe that getting right with God is hard. Uh, I beg to differ. I believe that Jesus died for a specific purpose. I don't believe that Jesus died, went through everything he went through in his ministry on earth to get to the point in his life, at the end of his life, to say, well, I'm dying on the cross for people's sins. I'm going to say it's finished, and I'm going to rise from the dead three days later, and people are going to see me, and then I'm going to be taken up into the sky before many before the apostles, and then I'm going to have the apostles go out through, uh, throughout the world to spread this gospel, to spread this good news. 
But yet, that's not going to be enough. Everything I did on earth is not going to be enough. Yet, I'll still have to have people <laughs> do certain amount of works. Do works and save themselves. And uh, See how ridiculous that sounds? It's because it is ridiculous. And because that when, when you believe that, when you actually believe that you contribute uh, something to your salvation. You keep yourself saved by your works, uh, rather than just simply by believing in Jesus Christ and that believing that salvation is a done deal because of what Jesus did, not because of anything you do or continue to do. Uh, when you do that, you, you set Jesus to the side. Galatians, Galatians chapter two, verse 21 is very clear. If righteousness came through the law, then Jesus died for absolutely no reason. <laughs> yes, the law within that context is a Mosaic law, but the point of that of what Paul is saying is that if you could do anything in addition to the finished work of Jesus Christ to save you, if righteousness came on the basis of law keeping, then Jesus died for no reason. If Again, I must emphasize this because many people do not want to believe in the words of Jesus, just like these Jews in John chapter 5 did not want to believe in the words of Jesus. If you believe that you can be made right with God, stay right with God, by keeping commandments, you have fallen under the Galatian heresy. And I don't want that for you. I want you to rely solely on Jesus Christ and his redemptive work he has done for you. And then, out of gratitude of that, out of gratitude for that, live with him and love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So, righteousness comes through placing your faith in Jesus Christ apart from what you do. Because it's all about Jesus. It's all about what he did for us. We can't do anything to save ourselves. I emphasize this so much because there's so much false teaching within the church that says otherwise. So I hope that you've been blessed by this, John chapter 5. Um, know for certain that um, Jesus is a miracle worker, that he sees you, um, he knows your struggles, he knows about COVID-19, and he's very well aware of people who are suffering, and he cares. Um, there is, There will be a day where there will no longer be death, there will no longer be tears, that is a promise. Um, but remember, John chapter 5, verse 24. If I want you to remember anything concerning John chapter 5, verse 24, it's that. Five, John chapter 5, verse 24. He who believes in me has passed from death into life, and you receive eternal life, period. So I pray that you've been blessed by this, and I look forward to diving into John chapter 6 with you next time. God bless.